it's very typical, as, especially women, and I try not yeah. to generalize, but that we do blame ourselves for things. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got a great quote of yours <laughs> about blaming ourselves. Um, would you ask the sun why it shines brighter on some days than others? <laughs> would you ask the moon why it breaks the darkness on some nights and not others? Such is the course of life. Some days we give our best, but other days we just exist. Some yes. days we are kings and queens of our minds and mm -hmm. souls, and some days we are spaces to our hearts. Yes. Um, ooh. <laughs> um, so I think on those dark days, on the days that the sun isn't shining, we blame ourselves, yes. right? Like it's our fault, we're doing this. But I love that when you say like, that analogy of like, if you just look at it in a, as a totality, yes, it's just the circle of life. Yes. So talk to me about that. It's so powerful. We are very hard on ourselves, especially during this time with social media being mm. so overwhelming for so many people. We think that every single day we need to have something amazing going on in our, in our lives or we have to be positive all the time. I can't tell you how many times people ask me, how do you stay positive all the time? And I'm just like, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. You but think that you I am, that but I'm not. Yeah. I'm not positive yeah. all the time. And so I feel that we are very hard on ourselves when we look at the lives of others and say, why haven't I achieved that? Or why haven't I achieved something similar to that? What more could I be doing? And so you're constantly focused on what needs to be done instead of what needs to prepare you for what needs to be done. And, and mm. right? So yeah. you, want, you want the recognition, you want the relevance, but you don't want to do the hard work that leads to that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wrote that just to say that, first of all, I always say, you are the sun. The very first entry in Mind Platter is titled, You Are the Sun. So I, I envision and visualize that I am a sun and some days I'm very bright and other days I, I'm hiding and you can barely see me and, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with not constantly being that shining light on everyone and everything. There's nothing wrong with you taking time, first of all, to take care of yourself and second of all, to, to ask yourself, where am I and where do I want to go? Instead of just saying, I want to be, I want to be in the spotlight. Mm. You can't be always in the spotlight. And if you are, that's going to burn you out at some point. It's the same with happiness, I think, as well. Right? Me included, like I'm always looking like, oh, I want to be happy. I want to be happy. But understanding that you can't always be happy. No. And it's that precise notion mm -hmm. that allows you that when happiness does come for it to be so um, yeah. consuming and enjoyable. Yes. But I don't think we would have that if we always had happiness. If you have nothing to compare it to. Right. I am not of the mindset um, that it's okay to tell people, just be grateful for what you have because look at all the people suffering and struggling. Okay. Because I feel that, that that gives people a sense of guilt for oh. wanting certain things huh. in their lives. Um, yeah. certain things that very much could be needed, like love and like, and, and I know that, you know, some people will say, well, that, that person doesn't have money to buy food and you're saying that you want to be loved, but love is such a fundamental thing to all of us, right? Dude, that's so hit me. You're so <laughs> right. So, so I don't like that attitude of saying, just be grateful for what you have because, because of all these other bad things it kind of puts you down in a way that makes you feel like you are asking for too much or you are being selfish by asking for something that you need, right? It, it's, it's not dealing with the issue that you're going through. Yeah. It's telling you compare it to something that's worse. Instead of saying compare it to something that's worse, say go help that person, right? Help them. This is the need that they have. Go help them with it if you can, but also help yourself mm -hmm. with what you need right? Yeah, the guilt thing really hit me when you said yeah. that because you're right is that, you know, I, I absolutely when I have, you know, bad digestion or my health isn't good, I'll try and say to myself, but look at other people, at least you don't have Crohn's disease, Lisa, at least you don't have this, right? I have Crohn's. You have, you have yeah. Crohn's? Oh, do you really? Yeah. Oh God, let's talk about that. <laughs> um, so how do you 
work your your mindset around that mm -hmm. so when i was first diagnosed i was immediately put on very heavy medication and i would feel like there's fire in my head and in my hands and i couldn't sleep and i constantly felt like i was disconnected from reality and so when i started looking into it um I thought to myself, wow, look at what I'm putting in my body. And you have to deal with the side effects, so you go on antidepressants and you go on sleeping pills and you go... So it's like dealing with a, with a chronic illness and also causing yourself so many other illnesses mm -hmm. and then taking more medications and so it feels like your body isn't even yours anymore. And I felt like I'm not here anymore, I'm not present anymore. And I'm sick and tired of this. And I just stopped every single medication that I was on completely. And my doctor said, you're crazy. People usually take six months to wean themselves off of these medications. And you're just doing it right away. And I said, I'm going to do well. I'm going to eat properly. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to stay away from stress or things that cause me stress. And I'm going to do it. And I've been off medication for about three years now. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. What made you take ownership there? I just, like I said, I felt like my body wasn't mine anymore. I was, I was constantly drugging myself with all these different medications and then wondering why I'm not feeling. Like the antidepressants that you go on, their main goal is to not make you feel, right? So you become numb. And you, and, and you know me by now, I'm a poet. I feel, I'm sensitive. I have a lot of emotions going on inside of me. So it feels like there's this flood going on inside of you and you can't make sense of it because you're not even given, your body isn't even functioning the way you want it to. You know, mm -hmm. it's being silenced in mm -hmm. some way, oh, okay. right? And so, and not, this is not to tell people don't go on antidepressants. Sure. Go on them if you need to. Yeah, absolutely. But that's how I felt. I felt numb and I felt like I wasn't dealing with what I was going through. It definitely seems like a massive theme in your life is um, being in situations where you have been silent. So you use that in, in regards mm -hmm. to Crohn's as well, which is incredible. Um, but you found you keep finding your voice, which yes. I think is amazing. Um, and especially you standing up and talking on National Women's Day and then how you were able to find that voice finally, because I'm sure there's a lot of people right now at home that is looking to find their voice. How do you do it? How do you get the guts and courage <laughs> to do it? And then stand up on such a public platform and be so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Going through the experience of being, um, of having power abuse exercised on me and feeling silenced by multiple power systems because this happened in my workplace and I, um, you know, I reported it and I spoke to many people who had power to do something about it and to, to raise my voice for me and um, I could consistently and continuously felt like I was being told, you know, this is, nothing's going to happen out of this. You know, there was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of telling me indirectly, this is your fault. Um, you're sensitive. You're, you could have said no at certain points. You could have, but when there's power involved, I've always said this, saying no to a person in power when you're here and they're up here is not the same as saying no to a person who's at your level of power, right? Mm -hmm. Consent is not the same when there's power involved. It's not the same because there's a lot of fear from the person who's down here. You think to yourself, what is this person in power going to do if I say no or if mm -hmm. I reject them or mm -hmm. if I push them away? That's why women specifically will stay silent about certain experiences because they know that it's going to be bad news for them down the line because those in power are going to say, oh, she's a troublemaker. She's, she's raised her voice about certain things before, so she might, you know. And that comes from a place of them, it's their own insecurities. Because if you, 
if you know that you're not going to make a mistake and you're not going to treat someone badly, then why would you not believe mm. uh, someone who's saying that they've gone through a certain mm. experience? So I, I had been going through that for a while and internalizing. No one knew. My family didn't know. I was too ashamed to admit that I had gone through an experience like that or that I had feelings for someone. That's a very shameful thing to admit, um, especially in my culture. And imagine sitting amongst your own family and hiding something like that, hiding an experience like that. It's like you're there and it would be easier for you to not be there because you're actively trying to cover up something, so much pain. It, it was a very much an internalized fear that I had and not wanting to disappoint them that stopped me from sharing anything. I, I wouldn't know how they would respond, but I assumed I was in so much fear. I assumed that they would be so angry with me and disappointed and say, we don't want anything to do with you anymore. And same thing with my workplace and with my colleagues and with my friends, no one knew. So it got to a point where I felt not, that not only did I physically shrink, I felt that my soul shrunk and my self-esteem was zero. And I just, I was disappearing bit by bit. And I got to a point where the image that people saw was manufactured. It wasn't me at all. It wasn't me. The me that existed on the inside was someone who was aching to be heard, but thinking, but I've already shared this with people who could have done something about it and they didn't do anything about it. So I must stay silent. And seeing this person in power, continuing to gain power, made me feel even more and more and more powerless. And honestly, it got to a point where I, I wasn't suicidal, but I was imagining that I wasn't present. I was imagining the world without me. And so the turning point for me was, do I continue to be this manufactured image that's being loved by and welcomed by people around me just for the sake of continuing to belong somewhere where I really don't belong? Or do I share the real me and risk losing everybody who loves me or who's welcomed me into their lives and actually be loved for who I am. And I wanted to be loved for who I am, as painful as it was. So I decided to put this person aside and let this person flourish. And so after I shared it, there were ripples starting to happen. And other women came forward and said, you know, he's done this to me years ago and or he's done this to somebody that I knew. So I thought I was the only one. <laughs> I wonder if these women came forward to someone before and they were also told nothing's going to be done about this. So just be quiet. Just like I was quiet. And in a way, that silence was protecting him mm -hmm. and it was protecting all of the other stories from being, from coming to light. And so when I discovered that there were others, I knew that something more had to be done with How this. soon after this did people start coming It was within the next out. few months, okay. yeah. Well, immediately I started getting messages from people. At this point it was like, I am the only one who's yeah. going to raise that voice. I'm not gonna wait for someone to save me. I have to do this on my own. And for somebody who was quiet her whole life and who wanted people's approval or just didn't want to stir any trouble or disturb any waters. That was big for me to Why? do. I took months to make sure that my intention was not to hurt this person, mm. but it was to allow this hurt person to be relieved, to start the healing process. And healing couldn't begin if I was ashamed of my story. So, when other women came forward on their own, um, all of a sudden, 
it all came back to me saying she's the one who started it. So I, I received a legal threat uh, two or three days before International Women's Day. This is leading you up to the speech. Yeah. Saying that if you don't be quiet, we are pursuing legal action against you. So I received this letter on Monday and my speech was on Friday. So I read it and it was a, it was a, I had never served, been served legal papers before, but you know, I showed them to my lawyer, we talked about this and we decided we're gonna, like we're going to not do anything about this. So on Thursday, I get a call from a local media source and I'm like, why are they calling me? Probably because it's International Women's Day and they want some kind of statement from right. me. Then I get another call, then my lawyer called, and I was like, okay, this is bigger than what I think it is. So they had gone to the media saying, we served. They is in the person you had to shared the story shared about. The story, yep. Him and his lawyers mm -hmm. went to the media saying, we have warned her not to talk about this anymore and to apologize for what she said. We will have people watching her during her speech tomorrow and taking notes so that if she does say something, we will proceed with our legal action. So imagine, less than 24 hours before a keynote speech, I am the only speaker um, where there's going to be over 700 people. It, it was packed, it was oversold, talking about International Women's Day, talking about women's rights at the time that the Me Too movement mm -hmm. and the, the Time's Up movement had exploded. T less than 24 hours, you're telling me, be quiet. I, and you know how stressful it is to prepare a speech. You just did a TEDx, <laughs> yes. right? I had to change everything. Here they are trying to silence me and my voice the day before my speech. So it had to become about, you cannot silence me. You cannot silence me. So I started my speech by saying, I heard that there are people taking notes. Just so you know, if there's a note you miss, just raise your hand and I'll repeat it for oh you. My God, that's <laughs> so that was basically me saying, you know, I, I'm telling people I am not going to be quiet because yeah. there was speculation in the media that night before saying, you know, we're expecting that she was, she's going to address the legal threat, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so this was me saying, of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me not to talk about it. I am going to talk yeah. about it. And so being aware of all of that, I said, um, I understand that this experience that I went through isn't an experience that you can really relate to because you didn't go through it or your daughter didn't go through it or your son didn't go through it. But if you think that I am someone's daughter and I have a father, I am someone's sister, I am someone's aunt, I am someone's, and I started saying all those things, said if you were to look at me that way, then you would see it differently. And I was trying so hard to tell them, to, 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 to help them empathize with the situation, to help them really understand that just because this didn't happen to you, you don't have, you're not off the hook. You need to understand that Every victim of any form of abuse is someone to someone, mm -hmm. is worthy of being heard, is worthy of having their story out there, is worthy of us really looking at that story and looking at what led up to it. Mm -hmm. And so at closer to the end of the, of the speech, I held up the legal papers and I said, I will not apologize for telling my story. I will not apologize for sharing my truth. And you silenced me for long enough. And here you are showing every victim of any form of abuse out there, showing them that this is what will happen to them if they share their story. I'm the voice of that girl or that boy sitting in the corner struggling with their story, afraid of what will happen if they share it. I am their voice. 
I don't amplify the voices of the abusers. I fight the voices of the abusers for those who experienced any form of abuse. So that's what happened at that speech. Yes. <laughs> and is that what you were telling yourself the night before? Because taking everything you've said into context of who you used to be, the person that like ripped up her journal because she never wanted to feel, that stopped writing for so long, that was always the person that was a pleaser, that wanted to be liked. And you go head first, like you just jump in with both feet, I'm going to speak out. Like that's so hard. And then you get served papers that says, if you do it more, we're going to come after you. Like I couldn't imagine going from one perspective, from one into another. When you're in that moment and you've been served, was there a moment of like, should I actually do this? No. There was no doubt. It means that I have something to say that scares them. Mm -hmm. So that I'm like going to your say, then? oh, yeah. That's I was telling my friend <laughs> last week, I, my voice is strongest when I'm the most enraged about any kind of injustice. Mm. I have that personality of being very calm and kind and I don't get upset. But when I get upset, you have no idea what's going to happen. It's not in a hurtful way. It's in a truthful, mm. I will not accept this kind of way. So I knew that my most powerful um, asset was my truth at that point. And so there was nothing to hide. There was nothing to hide. They made me angry in all the right ways, in all the ways that would make all the right words come out on that day. And I felt very empowered afterward. I didn't believe that I could question it. Yes. That was the thing. So yes. it was like, I took it as truth, 100%. I took it as truth from my dad because I very much admire and yes. love him. But my entire family, everybody, my entire community, the Greek Orthodox community, if you even question whether this belief is right or true to you, even in just the questioning of it um, is absolutely sacrilege. Yes. This is where we have to be self-aware. This is where we have to be um, self-accepting in order to build that foundation. Because if you go out into the world and you find people that are, you know, you get in unhealthy relationships mm -hmm. or things like that, if at least you have the foundation, then you've always got that to go back to. Yes. There is a part in Welcome Home, you definitely read this part, where I talk about the pain of leaving that office. Mm -hmm. And I say... You know, I, I can't tell you what the worst pain was. The lies that were told about me, being told that I was a liar. All, I list all these things. And I say, I say, the most painful thing was that when I left that room, I didn't know who I was. Because all of my belief before that was, I'm a good person. I'm honest. I'm someone who doesn't lie. I'm someone who experienced this story and now I'm walking out of there being told no that's not you I didn't know who I was and after that could you give the uh, just people who may not know the context yes so it was I was referring to an investigation that I went through where I was told that things I said were not true and were not bad enough and against another individual and against another person and you know, it was multiple people who said that I lied or made up lies about me that weren't true to paint me in a, in a bad, you know, light. And it completely broke me to see people who I trusted very much and people who I treated very well and mm -hmm. very nicely and with respect turn around and, and say those things about me. That broke me. It broke me. I had no idea who I was when I left there because... Even though you knew you didn't lie. Even though I knew I didn't lie, but because I allowed my view of who I was to be shaped by what the world told me, including those people, instead of being able to stand in my truth and say, I know I said the truth, I was in tears 
And, and it made me question things. It made me go back and relive everything. Did I? Did it? Did, did this really happen? Did You were gaslighting yeah, yourself. Did. I was, just like they had ga- gaslighted me. Because I had proof, and I was still questioning myself. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I want to teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confident workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. So that image of being the good person that I believed I was at that point, who never lied, who was a victim at that point, mm-hmm. in my view, I don't see myself as a victim now. I'm a lot you know, wiser and I see things differently. But at that point, I saw myself as so powerless, so weak, so helpless. I went through probably a midlife crisis at that point because I genuinely did not know who Nejwa was. I didn't. And now I was forced, thankfully, I'm very grateful for that, to figure out who she is. Even though all of these things from my past, like my upbringing and, you know, being taught to be a good person no matter what and being brought up in a, in a very conservative way and, you know, as a Muslim woman at the time, like, you know, just the littlest interactions with a man are considered, you know, big. And so instead of looking at all of that and saying, that's why that happened to me, mm-hmm. I can say... Even though all of that was true, it did not give someone the right to take advantage of it. I can't stop blaming my past on what someone chose to do to me. And that didn't come easily. That came after months and years, I would say, of at least two years of rebuilding, of just figuring out who I was. Like I talk in the clarity room about if your life were a blank canvas, what would it look like? If you wrote down right now exactly what your life looks like, down to what you wear and and how you speak and where you live and what relationship you're in and what things scare you and what things you consider are okay to do and what things just no, you can't do them. If you were to write them all out and say, do I... I agree with this. Remove the audience. There is no audience. Do I, at my core, without everything I've been taught, believe that this is the right way for me to live? If no, then cross it out and write something new. Rebuild that life. Draw out your own life. That's what I had to do. And that's what I continue to do to this day. I made so many changes and... I wouldn't take one thing back. I love that. And I love how you even frame it like this is, it's a journey, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you've written many books and you're very like beautifully eloquent about your experiences. Um, And I think it's so important though to highlight that even with everything that you've done and all the work that you've done on yourself, it's like you're never done, you know, and then it becomes a new thing in your life. There was something that you said that like really hit me about the past and the pain. And you've said about getting past, in order to get past the pain, I've got a great quote. Um, They meant something to you. Mm -hmm. It hurts because you believed them. It hurts because you saw a future with them, because you were vulnerable with them, because you spent so much time and energy on them. Of course, that's going to hurt. Is acknowledging the hurt then the biggest part of making sure, uh, in order to get past it? Absolutely, you have to acknowledge it. What we do is we wait for people to acknowledge it. Like, I can't heal until she apologizes. Or I can't heal until he sees what he's done to me. Why? You know what you went through. You really don't need that acknowledgement. Why do we think we do? Because we believe they have a lot more power than we do over our current situation. 
be honest with yourself, honestly. Do you genuinely need, I'm not talking about issues that go to court and you know, I don't want anybody to think I'm minimizing anything, mm -hmm. but with, with things that aren't that big, do you really need the person who hurt you to tell you, I hurt you and I'm sorry and I feel awful that I did it. It's beautiful to get it, but do you need it? Do you not know how painful the pain was when you experienced it? Do you need them to tell you how painful it was and give you permission to feel it? You don't need it, you want it. Because you believe your relief is going to come when they acknowledge what they put you through. And this is what I always say, even if they do, you think it's going to take the pain away, but it doesn't because you still have to heal from that pain. What is their acknowledgement and apology going to do? It's not like a magic, you know, switch or button that just all of a sudden you're healed. You're still going to be like, but why? You're still going to, you're going to hold on to it because you're, you're, you are not releasing the pain and the anger and the whatever it is that you're experiencing on the inside. You're not releasing it. You're putting all the power of, you, of your healing in their hands. So that's why, and I wrote about this in, in Sparks of Phoenix and in Welcome Home, the one who broke you cannot heal you. You have to heal you. You can't Expect the person who broke you into pieces to bring those pieces and say, I'm going to put you back together. You can't do that. You can, but why would you choose to do that? Someone who has the power to destroy you and uses that power, why would you trust them with rebuilding you? I am speaking figuratively, but, but you need to hear it that way. Mm -hmm. Someone who had the power to destroy you who chose to use that power. When you are vulnerable, you are open to injury. You are open to pain. That means you go into something knowing that someone has the power to destroy you, but you trust that they won't. You've given them that power. They've used that power. Why would you say, I'm gonna give you that power again so that you could fix what you broke? Mm -hmm. No. You don't do that to yourself. That's not, that's what self-abandonment is. That's what saying, but if they don't welcome me into their home, then there is no other home that welcomes me. Mm. That's where the analogy of home comes back in. Because you're waiting for someone, you're telling someone, do whatever, just welcome me into your life. Yeah, and it's like, they broke me so only they can fix me. Yes. Versus, I allowed them to break me, which means that I have the power now to make sure they don't, I yes. don't get broken yeah. again. You're not blaming the victim by saying that, Correct. but we absolutely give people the power to break us. The vulnerability is beautiful. It is what's needed for connection to happen. But vulnerability means, like I said, when I looked it up, when I was writing about it in Welcome Home, it is being open to injury. Mm -hmm. You're opening yourself up. You're opening your heart up. You're you're opening yourself up in a way where someone knows so much about you and how you are as a person and what hurts you and, and you're trusting that instead of them using that to break you, they're loving you and embracing you and being careful with you know the certain sensitive parts of you. Mm. So yes, we give people the power to break us. Yes, we do, so do they. And, and it's, it's needed for relationships of any sort, not just romantic relationships mm -hmm. to happen. That trust that you could break me if you wanted to, but I trust that you won't. You give the power to someone to love you and you give the power to someone to break you. It's their choice with what they do. Okay, right? that's amazing. And is building the house, the foundation, allow you to, when you're in the moment, still be vulnerable because here's the thing Absolutely. is that I've been in my relationship with my husband for over 20 years and it is I believe fundamentally important that you are vulnerable with your partner I, I, I honestly and maybe this is just the naivety of my own and my fixed mindset but I don't understand how you could have a beautiful long-lasting 
relationship with someone if you are not vulnerable. Now in saying that though, when people are vulnerable and it's been used against them, most likely people then shut that part of them down. Because I see so much, so many people, friends of mine, they stop being vulnerable. Like that's their answer to their next relationship. And Mm -hmm. I'm like trying to tell them that's not the answer. Mm -hmm. This is the way I see it. (laughs) I have a really good answer for you. (laughs) So basically you're living in um, protection mode. You're protecting yourself all the time, right? You are protecting yourself from potential harm instead of inviting into your life the people who deserve to be in your life. You are, you are in another way saying, if I one more time give the power to someone to break me in some way and they do break me, I, I can't handle it. I can't do it. So you're operating from a place of you really don't want this really bad outcome to happen. So you're stopping all possibility that a good outcome will happen. Mm -hmm. So your power is not within you. It's within that bad possibility that could happen. Absolutely. And I always think of, you know, what if I, you know, jump, but what if I fall? but also what if I fly? It's like you're only focusing on the what if I fall, so I'm not going to jump at Mm -hmm. all. So Mm -hmm. if you are constantly, you know, wearing that shield and saying, I'm not going to open up and be be vulnerable because I've done that in the past and I've been hurt, then your power is with everyone that's behind that shield Mm -hmm. because you're telling them you can really hurt me. And you're not even focusing on the people who will come up to you and hug you Mm. and love you and care for you. And this is a lot more beautiful than, you know, for people who are listening to this, having, allowing someone into your life who loves you that way is so much more worth it than living from a place of fear that you are not going to get this Mm -hmm. living living from a place of fear not even that you're not going to get this beauty but that you might get the ugliness and the pain and the so you're basically walking around your life not being an active participant in it because you're just you're just protecting yourself that's all you're doing when i talk about boundaries and welcome home i say boundaries aren't about being in protection mode Boundaries are about knowing that what you have within is so valuable that you will not allow certain people to, you know, come near it or hurt it or whatever. Boundaries are, they stem from self-worth. They don't stem from, Mm -hmm. I need to hide myself and cover from the world and and, and I'm, I'm drawing this boundary so that you can stop your behavior. No, it's about, I'm drawing this boundary because... What I have within is so valuable and your behavior doesn't show that value. There's a big difference there. So it's the same thing for people who, you know, are, are living in, in defense mode their whole life. You are giving power to what you are shielding yourself from as opposed to giving power to yourself and to all of the beautiful experiences that could also happen mm. at the same intensity that the the bad things could happen, but you just have to allow yourself to open up to that. And if someone hurts you, okay. Why aren't you able to overcome the pain? Like, why is it, why is it so painful? What story does it tell you about yourself? Because for me, that story was, I don't deserve that, which I refer to in Welcome Home as home. When I, I share that story of when I was a little girl and I'm sitting in you know, the room upstairs and my cousins are opening gifts and I'm thinking... Why, why can't I have that love, being embraced, feeling like I belong somewhere, feeling like I fit in somewhere? That story happened when I was less than 10 years old and it continued. That's what made me change everything about myself in terms of, you know, if, if I knew what criteria were required to belong in a place, I would mold into that. Instead of, 
walking into that place as I am. And again, I didn't even know who I was. I'm like, okay, that's what I need to be mm -hmm. to be to please that person and to 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 be worthy of love or or attention or welcoming by that person. So that's what I'm going to do. So I wasn't being loved and welcomed and respected and you know, seen as worthy. It was the image I manufactured based on what I believed they wanted to see, <laughs> right? And that was because I believed I, I did not deserve to be welcomed and held on to. And until I healed that, I didn't break that pattern in my adult years. So why are you so afraid of feeling pain? If vulnerability is in your mind definitely going to lead you to pain let's say it will why are you so afraid of feeling that pain like what does it tell you about yourself heal that and once you heal that you heal you and you're able to be you so now that when you figured that out and you realized it came from my childhood and these moments that have just stuck with me, right? It's crazy, girl, how much we can just say, oh, yeah, 30 years ago, one time one person said this to me and it ends up changing the whole way that we feel about ourselves for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. So understand that this is an issue for you, that this was a lot of things that stand, that this is a trigger. What were the first things that you had to do to then unwire that trigger? The first thing I remember is allowing myself to be alone and feel whatever I needed to feel. Like when I first realized, and this was two, a little bit over two years ago, right before I wrote Welcome Home. The moment I realized that that's where the pain stemmed from is, is believing as a child, I did not deserve home. I didn't deserve the feeling of home. And I cried and cried and cried because as a child, you don't know how to label something. You don't know how to, you just internalize it and you keep it there. As truth. Yes, as truth. And so you know, and, and I was really, you know, well advanced in terms of how logical I was about life and emotions. And so there was this clash of who I was logically and, and, and on a mature level, but how I, you know, carried myself through life. It was from that belief that I will continue to work hard to get people to hold on to me because I don't deserve that. That's the subconscious belief that was there. And once it came into my conscience, I was like, okay, I, I right now don't believe that about myself, but clearly I did for the longest time. So I need to allow that eight or nine year old me to feel that pain and I need to right now with where I am in my life, empathize with her and speak to her the way I wish someone spoke to me then, right? And, and forgive myself now for, you know, allowing her to, to continue to, to live out that truth for so long. And not in a way that's like, you know, I blame myself, no, but, but I, I needed to forgive myself for abandoning myself for as long as I did because I believed that home was outside of me, anywhere outside of me, and that I needed to work really hard to be welcomed into it. So the first thing is feel it. Because when you were younger, you didn't. You internalized it as truth. You felt something, but you didn't know how to tell yourself that's not true. You didn't know how to soothe yourself then. You didn't know how to, you know, practice self-care and self-love. You didn't know how to name it. You just, you literally internalized it as truth. And so you need to, you know, unlearn that. You need to get rid of that and be compassionate with the self of yours that acted from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you not actually blame yourself? How do you not hold on to or beat yourself up? Because actually I heard you say, it's like when people are in bad relationships, 
especially if it's very toxic and you recognize it's a toxic relationship and you just stay with it because you want to fix them mm -hmm. or you know oh my god maybe i'm not working hard enough and then finally you leave how do you not beat yourself up about staying how do you not um hold on to that and um or not even hold on to you know the fact that for all these years you've been holding on to this notion that you weren't good enough mm -hmm. how do you let go of that because we all know that that doesn't serve you that can't help you grow right that what that will be the block for you to be able to get over it and change mm -hmm. but it's really hard because i think so many people stay in that place of beating themselves up mm -hmm. how did you not either not go there or get over it or judge yourself yeah yeah because many people do how yeah. could i have stayed for so long how could i have allowed someone to speak to me that way repeatedly or treat me that way or right. It's really self-judgment, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the way from my personal experience that I didn't go back to that place is even though I knew that in certain moments in the past, I knew better. I knew on a logical level what I deserved. I really did. And I would immediately after a certain interaction of accepting a lot less than what I deserved or maybe you know, if, if someone had berated me in a certain way, spoken to me in a way that's really disrespectful, and I went back to that and put myself in that setting, I knew that I was doing the wrong thing. But I couldn't, I felt that I couldn't not try harder because that was the pattern I had followed and fallen into my whole life. So even though I knew that in certain moments I was aware this was wrong, I should not allow it to happen anymore, I had to tell myself, Nejwa, there was a reason that you kept going back. Mm. Maybe it was that you couldn't believe that someone could be so cruel and you, were, you thought that maybe if you changed them, maybe if they, you know, felt badly for what they were doing, they will turn around and say, I'm sorry, and they would mm -hmm. in turn become a better person. Maybe this, you weren't asking for abuse. You weren't asking for someone to berate you. You weren't asking for someone to lie to you. You weren't asking for someone to speak to you in the most hurtful ways possible, whatever it is. You weren't asking for that. You were asking for love. And you were hoping that that's what you'll get. You were asking for respect and you were hoping that's what you'll get. So I would go back to those moments and say, it's, I, I genuinely wasn't going back asking for the worst case scenario. I, there was that hope that it would be the opposite. So that allowed me to be compassionate with myself and to, to show myself that empathy. And I know that at the end of the day, my hope was all good things. My hope was that things would turn around to be better. And also, I didn't see a life past this person or past this situation. Mm -hmm. But now I do. And just because I accepted it for so long, it doesn't mean that I have to accept it for the next 20, 30, or whatever years mm -hmm. of my life. Like people struggle with change and with walking away and with putting an end to something because they worry of like, that's just not who I am. I've accepted it for so long. I know myself. And where I want to start is the fact that you didn't feel like you belonged anywhere. Mm -hmm. A lot of people fight that, not knowing where they belong. Talk me through how you felt and then how you got out of that. Mm -hmm. I think we tend to believe that home is a house, a physical place where you can stay. When really home is the place where your soul feels like it belongs, where you feel like you can be unapologetically yourself and you are being loved for who you are. A place where you don't have to work hard just to be loved. And uh, because my parents were traveling between Lebanon and Canada from the age of, from my age of eight to 16, I had to live with multiple relatives. And it's, it, it never, to me, it's never like, oh, they treated me badly. Mm -hmm. It's not like that at all. It's just my own internal feelings of displacement and mm -hmm. not knowing where home really is mm -hmm. and not knowing whether me being the way that I am, which is a very sensitive, 
girl, very sensitive human, I don't know if I should show that to those around me because it, I don't know if they want to listen to my voice. I don't know if they see what I need to be seen about me. And so, you know, being bullied at school during that time by both, as you mentioned, students and teachers made it even more difficult for me to feel like my voice was worthy of being heard. Mm. And so I stayed quiet for so long. And I love Lebanon. It's my home country. I really do love it, but it never felt like home. So then when I, when I moved to Canada, I remember the first day a teacher saw me, and I used to cover my hat at the time, my hair. And uh, she, she said to me, oh, I know who you'll mix well with. So she took me to a group of girls who also wore the hijab at the time. And I remember standing amongst them thinking, I don't belong here. Really? Yeah, because I, it was such a cultural shock for me that even they looked like me, but they were, most of them, born and raised in Canada. I come from a village of a thousand people. You know, we, we, everybody there was Muslim. Everybody there was, you know following the same kind of lifestyle. Mm. And here I was in a brand new country where there are different rules and there are different ways that even people who resemble me uh, live differently um, within those. It never even dawned on me <laughs> that that would be the case. Like, yeah. That's such a powerful message of like, we all make assumptions. We do, yeah. Yes. So did you tell people like, yeah, this doesn't feel no, like my group? Because or? I just, I was very quiet. I remember not going to the cafeteria of my school, of my high school, mm -hmm. until the second semester of that year. And I only went once because a friend of mine needed to get something for lunch. I never mixed with people. I stayed in the library at lunch, mm -hmm. did my homework for the next day, and that was it. I just never mixed with people. Never. It was such a lonely time. Ladies, 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 I know sometimes you worry that you're not good enough. Trust me, nobody knows that better than me. I spent almost a freaking decade having my soul sucked out of my body, doing something that I didn't love. Finally, even though I was scared to freaking death, I decided I was going to go for it. And I've ended up building the life of my dream, a life I couldn't have imagined because I realized that radical confidence is being afraid and doing it anyway. I wrote this book for you with 10 no BS lessons that you need to go from feeling stuck and frustrated to doing anything that you set your mind to. Was it that like, so obviously looking back now, were you doing it as like a safety because like you could trust your, you being by yourself? Because if you look at these people um, that you could, you didn't even make the effort, right? You said you didn't go to the cafeteria. Was it that for you safety was standing back and keeping to yourself? Yes, it was safety and also fear. Okay. It was fear that I would be judged for, mm -hmm who I was and, I, and I, I think part of me didn't even want approval part of me had given up on mm. being part of something that I just wanted to go to class and go home and that was it when I reflect back on those years I see them in black and white yeah. because they were very very much there was no there was there was no feeling of joy or feeling of um, being present. It was just getting by, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that was my life. It was just getting by and hopefully one day happiness will come because that's what everybody tells you is that mm -hmm. it comes at some point, go to school, get a job, get married, and then happiness will come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got an amazing quote. I've actually got a ton of quotes <laughs> yeah. from you, but, um, <laughs> I want to talk about pain. You wrote something about it that just hit me hard. You said when pain knocks on your door, mm. let it in. Yeah. If you don't, it will knock harder and harder. Its voice will become louder and louder. So let it in, spend time with it, understand it, then walk it to the door and let it leave because it's time for you to welcome happiness. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Were you able to do that? Is that what you did? And then if so, how do you do that? Mm. I struggled with, I struggled for a very long time. You can see I'm getting emotional just hearing that because I remember when I wrote it. I struggled for a long time with accepting that what I went through was painful. Because instead of accepting that I went through a painful experience, I accepted that something was wrong with me and that I had to fix myself and that I had to fix the way I was thinking about things. So I was in denial of what happened to me, sort of like a defense mechanism against knowing what needs to be done to resolve mm. that pain. And so I, I resisted allowing myself to see it as something that wasn't my fault. And I kept it at the door. And, you know, it goes from being on your mind for an hour a day to being on your mind two hours a day to being on your mind all the time. When you fall asleep, when you wake up, you're constantly tunnel visioned on that pain. And it feels like physical pain. That's how bad it becomes. So if you don't allow it, it's going to keep knocking. It'll keep knocking. And if you don't just say, you know what? Life has thrown pain at me. I can't keep ignoring it. I have to allow it in. I have to understand why it hurts so much. And that's difficult. No one wants to feel pain. No one wants to be in pain. Mm -hmm. But this is the nature of life. So I treat it as a visitor. I say, you're welcome in, but you're not welcome to stay. You're welcome to have a tea with me. We'll talk about this and then you leave. And then I have another visitor, which is happiness. So that's why I wrote that poem, because I really believe that if pain is knocking on your door and you deal with the pain and take it out of the way, you're allowing room for yourself to see and feel that happiness that's waiting at your door. God, I love yeah. that. Okay, so take me into how you actually then do that. Mm -hmm. So taking, you're in pain, you're closing the door, you're trying to ignore it, you're trying to ignore it. When did you finally open the door? What did that actually look like? So what are the steps you have to take? And then how do you close that door again? I think step number one is recognizing and naming what you went through. Okay. Yes. So how did you name it? For me, it was abuse. It was gaslighting. It was manipulation. Um, it was uh, dealing with narcissism and playing on my emotions. Mm -hmm. And I think we hear the word abuse, but we don't really understand it mm -hmm. unless we, or understand that we are going through it unless we see what it looks like for others. Because a lot of times we mistaken love for abuse. We say that somebody treating us a certain way is a, a loving way, or it's, it's a way for them to discipline us in some way, when really it's abuse, but we don't have the word to put it onto what's going on with us. And so when I started researching things that I was going through, things that I was being told, I came across words like gaslighting. And I'm like, gaslighting? What does Which what does, mean? Yeah, what does it mean? Because I heard you say it, but I didn't hear the explanation. Yeah, so gaslighting is when somebody distorts your own understanding of your own reality, when they try to change your story. So for example, imagine that somebody that you trust very much, this could be your partner, mm -hmm. um, tells you, you remind them of a certain thing they said to you and they say, I didn't say that. And because you trust them, you trust that they're telling the truth. So they make you question your own reality. Mm. So this didn't happen because it actually happened. This happened because you manufactured it in your brain. Mm -hmm. And so they play mind games on you. And um, when I think of gaslighting, I think I would go through moments where I would feel like I'm completely here, I understand what's going on, and then two seconds later I'm questioning, is it really what happened or is it what my brain is telling me happened? And so it's, it's, mm. it's incredibly destructive for a person and it's so hard to get out of. So 
Step number one yeah. is naming it. Yeah. Because once you name mm -hmm. it, you, you're like, okay, now I can categorize everything that I'm going through and say this is where it falls under. This is what needs to be done moving forward. This is, this is what I need to stop allowing to happen. This is what I need to do about it in terms of raising your voice. Um, and this is what I will do moving forward in case this arises from the same person or from other people. That's the beginning point. Mm. Um, and then you get to seek help. So I, I still see a therapist to this day, not as intensely as I saw her before, but she said, I remember when you first came here, you were just so, like there was darkness over you mm. and you were so hopeless and didn't, see that you had any power within you to stop what's happening or to overcome all these powerful people who are trying to bring you down and here you are and the power that you had was that you shared your story and so that's where my healing began and at that point I had to talk about it and I had to understand how I got myself to a point where my whole self-worth and my whole image of who I was and understanding of who I was was in someone's hands, mm -hmm. just one person's hands. And so there was a lot of unlearning that had to happen. And there was a lot of reflecting on my earlier years that had to happen to understand what was it that um, the making of Nejwa, the making of mm -hmm. me, of, of the me that was in a position to be so vulnerable and to be so taken advantage of, and I learned through time that to separate the fact that I had been looking for a home, I had been looking for love, and to say that just because someone took advantage of those needs and of those dreams, it doesn't mean that something was wrong with me for wanting them. We all want love, Ooh, right? <laughs> no, you just gave me the chills there. <laughs> You have to draw that barrier because you blame yourself for wanting to be loved. You blame yourself for wanting to belong. You blame yourself for wanting to be relevant to someone when you shouldn't do that. That's the most beautiful, pure thing to want to feel loved. And then somebody looking at you and saying, oh, she's vulnerable. I'm going to take advantage of that. And you have to separate those two things and say, actually, your choice to take advantage of my need for love is all on you. It's not my weight to carry. It's not my burden to carry. Um, how do you then, when you're in that moment, so you've done all the unwinding, you've really worked on yourself, then approaching, uh, let's say, well, I still want love. I still want to yeah. be with somebody. I understand now that I can't let someone take advantage. Were there certain things that you put into play where you're like, okay, these are gonna be triggers I'm gonna look out for so that you know not to make that same mistake again? Because I think that's the fear people have, right? I gave it my all to this relationship and I got taken advantage of, they abused it. And now I'm so fearful of giving it over again. Have there been things that you've told yourself is like, okay, next time I'm gonna do this? Yes, yeah, so in terms of having rules my rules don't have to do with people they okay. have to do with me Ooh. so they have to do with me drawing healthy boundaries mm -hmm. and not allowing myself to compromise my um my sense of self mm -hmm. and my sense of being of who i am just to allow somebody in or to allow myself to fit into someone's life. So the work has been on myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand that sometimes we do have to say, this is what I'm looking for in a person. But I think what comes before that is knowing yourself so that when it gets to a point where you are getting to know someone or you, you are getting into a relationship, the moment you feel that you have to change things about yourself, then that gives you a red flag and you say, you know what, I am, I'm feeling like I have to change things about myself. And 
don't get me wrong, we all have things to change about ourselves. Right. And sometimes being in a relationship with someone pushes you to be a better version of yourself. But if it's pushing you to be a worse version than yourself, then that's mm -hmm. when you know this is not right for me. This is my need for love overriding my need for the right love for me. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So I think it, it begins with you working on what you accept, what you don't accept, um, how you would want somebody who really loves you to treat you, and, and just knowing those things so that you're prepared. So in education, we say, as a teacher, I want to be proactive. I want to uh, make sure that I set my students up for success and for not misbehaving before that misbehavior happens oh. so that I have to deal with it then. Instead of saying, I'm just going to be myself and then when bad behavior arises, I will punish them for it. And I think it's the same thing with relationships when you're proactive and you start with working on yourself and knowing who you are. Instead of waiting to be in a relationship to figure those things out based on who that person is. And I know that sometimes people get into relationships at a younger age and they have to go through this experience mm. of, of turmoil and not knowing. And so I don't want anybody listening to think to themselves, oh, I did something the, the, the wrong way. Everybody falls into this. You don't learn unless you fall down. And, and I learned by falling down many times and getting back up. And so if you're at a point where you're wondering how do I move forward, then this could be a great place to start. I love that. Talk to me actually, something you just said um, about like not beating ourselves up over things, like mm -hmm. it's not wrong. Um, how do you not beat yourself up then? Um, are there things that you do or do you have a situation where you're like... <sighs> this taps into self-love and my definition of self-love. Mm -hmm. For me, self-love is picturing the person that you love the most and telling yourself, I will not treat myself any less than I would treat that person. If you were my most loved person on this earth, if you had a bad day and came to me, I would listen to you, I would understand you, I would make sure that you're feeling pampered, that you're feeling like you're safe here. So why can't I do that for myself when I'm having a bad day? Why can't I do that for myself when I make a mistake? Self-love, is, is not treating myself any less than I would treat my loved ones and not allowing anybody to treat me less than I would treat my loved ones. When I make a mistake, and sometimes we make mistakes knowing that we're making them, yeah. I just remind myself that I am human. Yeah. The narrative that most of us go to when we go through any kind of failure mm -hmm. is something's wrong with me. I've known this all along, something's wrong with me, or I'm not destined for happiness, or I'm not destined for love, and I just need to accept it. That's the, those are the narratives we usually go to. Mm -hmm. um, but the real narrative is much different from that. Everyone has their own path, and everyone has their own destiny. Nobody knows that. You don't know that. So to give yourself a verdict mm -hmm. long before your life is over, Ooh. you know, is, is a very bad thing. Because if you've already believed about yourself that you are not destined for happiness or that something is wrong with you, then everything is going to confirm that for you. And you're only going to see the things that will confirm that for you, yeah. right? But if you say, if you, if you change that narrative and say, instead of saying, I'm not destined for happiness, to say, I took a shot at happiness and I learned something. Yeah, one of my favorite phrases is, if you believe you can, you can. If you believe you can't, you can't. Yeah, um, and I believe that too, yeah. yes. You should never be okay with being treated that badly. You should never be okay with being betrayed. You should never be okay with having someone you trusted so much turn around and treat you as if you never meant anything to mm -hmm. them. You should never be okay with that. Mm -hmm. I'm getting emotional just reading it. Can you talk to me about that yes. quote, what led to it? When someone hurts us or walks away from us, we believe that strength is showing 
that that didn't hurt us. Or strength is getting over that faster than they got over us or mm. whatever it is. We struggle with, why does it hurt so much? And so I started that by saying the, the few words before that, it hurts because they meant something to you. It hurts because you saw a future with them, because you shared memories with them. Of course it's going to hurt. And you should never ever pretend to be okay with being mistreated, with being lied to, with being treated as if you never existed in that person's life. Not being okay with it doesn't mean that you're weak. It means that you are actually using your emotions. No human would not react to someone treating them badly. Don't push yourself to a point where you gaslight yourself out of your own pain. Oh, you know? go deeper on that. Like, don't talk yourself out of feeling how bad that pain is. Don't tell yourself, well, you know what? Other people have it worse. Or if I show in any way, not that I'm saying go public and share how much you're struggling, but go public within. Go public within yourself and be able to say, this experience is hard and it's going to take some time for me to heal from it. When I say don't gaslight yourself, I mean don't be that person that tells you it wasn't bad enough. It could have been worse. You were saved, you know? What if it lasted for a year longer or for two years longer? That's all gaslighting. Don't be the person who does that to yourself. Feel the pain. Be able to say, moving forward, if a person treats me in a way that is similar to what I just experienced, because I've allowed myself to feel the pain of how it actually feels on the inside, I'm going to draw a line and say it ends here. If you don't allow yourself to do that, you'll continue falling into the same mistake until you learn the lesson it's meant to teach you. Oh my God! <laughs> God, that was so strong. You hit me so hard. And as you were talking, it made me think about how saying, no, 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 it's okay, um, ends up becoming a, um, a value of how much we, we find ourselves worthy. Absolutely. So actually talk to me about that and about yeah. how we tell ourselves what we're worth by yes. saying it's okay. Yeah. So when you don't give yourself permission to experience any kind of emotion, you are not living from a place of, I believe I have this much worth. Mm -hmm. The best example I can give you is this, to anyone listening as well. If a friend of yours went through a heartbreak, would you tell that friend of yours, just, let's just, just get over it, it's fine. You know, let's just distract ourselves by doing something else. Or do you look at your friend and say, you know what, that was a really hard experience you went through. Do you want to talk about it? Mm -hmm. Do you want to rest for the night? Do you want to maybe go on a trip where we could be far away and you could just gather your thoughts? Because you believe that your friend deserves that. Why don't you believe that you deserve that? Why do you believe that the best thing you can do right now is get up, find something to do, distract yourself, maybe achieve something in another area in your life, but that pain, you just tuck it away. You bury it. So it's okay for you to, you know, take that energy that you have and say, I'm going to create something with it. Mm. That's beautiful. That's what many of us do. I do that. I write. But don't do that at the expense of feeling, releasing, expressing, screaming, feeling angry. Don't curb all of that mm. and say, if I can create something, I'll feel good about myself and this pain will go away. It will not go away. In Welcome Home, I wrote, and in the nectar of pain, when pain knocks on your door, let it in. Sit with it. Have tea with it. You need to do that. You need to open the door within yourself to feel the pain that is already within you. There's one part in Welcome Home where I, 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 wrote, I talked about this analogy and I said, you know, when pain knocks on your door, if you keep it at the door, yeah, it might stay there for a while, but you're adapting your life 
to noise in the background. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, that door is actually not outside of you. That door is within you. Mm -hmm. The pain is there. It's just asking you to release it in some way so that it could leave you. And I just found that so powerful. Pain isn't external to you. That's so powerful. Um, you're very open, very vulnerable in the book, which I think is so beautiful. And you talk about Thank your own you. experiences. And it's very powerful to hear someone who has done the internal work, has been doing this for years, and finding yourself, okay, so it's, it's an evolution. You're never one and done. And so hearing about your experiences with other, you know, other men in your life and how you then navigated that in not beating yourself up, that mm -hmm. you find yourself there again. And I know a lot of women do. Yes. Um, and so I, I believe, and I'd love to hear from you, that it becomes about self-worth, about mm -hmm. what you think about yourself and how you feel about yourself and allowing you use the, the home as the analogy. And I believe you say, when you build your home in other people, you give, give them, them the, the power, power to, to make, make us you homeless. homeless. Yes. That was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So now saying, okay, well, I don't want to be homeless. I want to own my power, which I think means that I have to assess my worth, how I see my worth, where I give my worth to other people, where mm -hmm. I give that the power to other people. Because when we find things like rejection, we go straight to, well, this must mean I'm not worthy. And mm -hmm. you talk about the fact that we search for the proof that we are not worthy. Mm -hmm. So please talk to yes. me about that. So these are the words that actually gave birth to Welcome Home. The biggest mistake we make is that we build our homes in other people. We build those homes and we decorate them with the care and love and kindness, everything that we want to come home to at the end of the day. So when those people walk away, those homes walk away with them and all of a sudden we feel empty. And that emptiness we feel on the inside doesn't mean this is the most important part. The emptiness we feel on the inside doesn't mean that we have nothing left within us. It just means that what we created, we placed outside of us. And if we were able to create it once, we are able to create it once again and put it within. So when a relationship ends and you find yourself struggling to find someone else who will tell you, you deserve love, so that you could tell yourself, oh, if someone loves me, then I deserve love. Instead of saying, I'm going to take some time and understand why I allowed myself to abandon myself so much that once that person walked away, I literally couldn't even be with myself. That's what being homeless is. You couldn't even see the path back to being alone with yourself. You just couldn't stand it. You started craving what you had with that person. So the foundation of your home is self-acceptance and self-awareness. Once you have those two elements, you can build whatever home you want within. Mm. But if you're not aware of who you are, and if you're not in full, radical acceptance of who you are, you cannot have a home within because you are building a home for someone you don't know. Ooh, okay, so I want right? in real time, can you give me an actual example? Because at least how yes. I process things is when I read your book, you give your own story. Yes. And you, giving your story and then how you processed it was so yeah. powerful to me. So if you don't mind yeah. sharing that. So I'm going to take you to a moment when I was feeling really down because this person that I was interested in and who was interested in me as well, but I was really confused. I didn't know what was going on. And, and the reason I connected with this person was that I saw sorrow in him the first time I met him. I remember as I was sitting down, the way that he got up to greet me, I immediately felt in my soul sorrow. And I connected with him. And, you know, over time, we would have these conversations, like really deep conversations, and I grew to care for him in a way where it was like, you know, I, I, I want to lift you up. I want you mm. to see your worth. I want you to see that, you know, you can get out of what you experienced in your past relationships and your hardships. And so my connection, looking back at it now, it was that I wanted to save him. 
Because and that I, made you feel good about yourself. Made me feel good about myself. That's the notion of building a home within another person. Mm -hmm. Because you, you believe that you on your own don't deserve love unless you do something to get that love. So in this case, what that something is, I'm saving you. I'm believing in you. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing something in you. So Can I'm, I add one more thing then, actually? Yeah. Also, there's something too... Almost saying, well, my past, now I can use it for good. Yes. So all the hardship and heartbreak that you've experienced in your past almost allows you to go, well, but this, see, this is why it was great. And in a way, it's toxic. And in a way, it's manipulative. And I want every person listening to this who identifies as an empath and as a people pleaser to take that to heart, please. <laughs> Just because you expend so much of your time and love and energy trying to help someone and save them and go out of your way and do whatever it is that you need to do to save them and to love them. I know it's hard to hear, but they don't owe you that in return if you've chosen to give it freely. Because we hurt after giving so much and we're like, well, don't I deserve something in return? Like I tried so hard and that is toxic and that is manipulative. And I've even identified that within myself. I catch myself when that happens. And it's just because I think, you know, I give so much. Like, how could you treat me this way? And then I think, let me separate what I've chosen to give you from what you've chosen to reciprocate. And I can say, instead of saying, you owe me, to treat me the same way I treated you, I could say, this is how I deserve to be treated. And if they choose to continue treating you in a way that you don't accept, you walk away instead of staying there, begging them to treat you right or begging them to reciprocate to you what you have given them, right? So let me take you back to the story because it's still in my head. So I'm sitting there in a moment when I sensed that he had pulled away, and it was a pattern. He would open up to me and have these deep conversations with me. And then as soon as he would sense that we were, you know, developing feelings towards each other, he would just pull away. And I would feel it immediately, even though, you know, it was mostly through text and calls. And sometimes we would meet for coffee and stuff. I would feel mm. it. I just knew. So I'm sitting there feeling so down about myself and just feeling like, why isn't he texting me? Why isn't he calling me? Like, I didn't say anything wrong. Yesterday he was happy. And what happened now? And I was like confused because I didn't know. It was kind of like, from his point of view, I open the door to you when I want, to you speaking to me kindly and nicely and believing in me and saving me. But when I shut that door, mm -hmm. You know, I, I just won't tell you when and I'm, I don't care about how you feel. And I'm miserable. And this was a few years ago and I'm just thinking to myself, Nejwa, why haven't you answered your own call? Why are you waiting for a call or a text to tell you you're worthy? Like you're feeling so miserable and so empty and so depleted and so weak because someone chose not to figuratively and literally answer your call. Why haven't you answered your call? So if you notice in the self-love chapter, one of the gems that I use is answer your own call for love. When you need love, don't sit there on the floor in your bathtub, in your bedroom, with your phone by your side, waiting for someone to magically write a couple of words. You see their name on your screen. <laughs> and I know people listening can identify with this. And all of a sudden you feel great and you can get up and you have all the energy in the world. Why can't you do that for yourself? When you believe that you deserve full and whole love, and I'm saying that to myself in that moment, when you believe that you deserve full, whole, clear, open love, that's without condition, that's without 
you know, it's not dependent on the person's mood. Mm -hmm. It's not dependent on what they're going through. Love. You can draw a boundary with me if you're going through a hard time. Don't disrespect me if you're going through a hard time. You can draw a boundary with me if you're having a hard time. Don't take all of your stresses and out on me. Mm -hmm. You can tell me I need space. And in that moment, what I was doing was I was allowing everything that he was going through to be, you know, that's an exception. You know, I would listen to friends talking to, up to me about their stories. And, and I, if they had told me something like what I was going through, you know, with this person who I refer to as Noah in Welcome Home, I would have said to them, no, leave. Mm -hmm. But in my view, that was the exception. I could understand him. I knew what he was going through. But to anyone listening, you don't deserve someone's burdens to be placed on your back for them to believe that you actually love them. You don't have to allow someone to just completely demolish your image of who you are and your image of your self-worth and your understanding of self-worth just because they're going through a hard time or just because, you know, once that pain starts spilling on other people, that's, that's not kind. The price of someone loving you should not be you not loving you. The price of someone loving you should not be you expending everything that you have within to lift them up or save them or they should be able to love you without you doing all of that stuff. You know, I hear people talk sometimes and they're like, we went through awful times or, you know, someone will say, she went through the most difficult times with me. I really mistreated her. I really did this. I really did that. And she stayed. And, and now I see like she really loves me. And mm -hmm. I'm like, you didn't need to have her go through all of that to prove to you that she really loves you. Oh God, that's so strong and vice versa, right? Like you even say, well, if I love him, then of course I'm gonna stick it out. Of yeah. course I'll do this. So in my experience, mm. I thought waiting around and making sure that, you know, he was comfortable, that he was happy, that basically the power dynamic of our communication was in his hands. When really what I should have done was be honest with myself and say, what am I looking for at this point in my life? I want a relationship where it's open, there's communication, there's, you know, there isn't these little games or being confused or, you know, trying to guilt the other person for, for what you're experiencing, mm -hmm. where there isn't any of that. And, and I, would, I would gaslight myself by saying, but, you know, but, but he's not ready for that. So, so I, I just, I waited around for a little bit and I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. I should not have done that. That came from a place of literally just seeing that the only person I could have that with was this person who I, in retrospect, barely knew. It was more that connection of sorrow that I had with him. And is that why you say self-awareness is one of the very first Absolutely. things that you need to do to build yeah. your house, your, the foundation of your yes. house? You have to be aware of why you are the way that you are, why you behave the way that you behave and why you connect with people the way that you do. Like if I see something in you, that's a reflection of me, hmm. right? Interesting. I was reading um, a book and, and there was a story of a little girl who is in the airport and there's a guy waiting for, um, they're all waiting for the same flight and it was delayed for weather circumstances and the guy is like getting really upset and the little girl goes up to him and like starts making silly faces and he just says, go away. And then the little girl comes back around and smiles again <laughs> and you know, the third or fourth time he broke down and started laughing. And so what they're saying in the book is, you treat people based on your worldview. This mm -hmm. little girl's worldview was everybody's nice, everybody's kind. I'm going to keep trying to get that out of him. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. when, when someone mm -hmm. that you are, whether it's a friend or somebody you're in a relationship with, you view the world in a certain way. You can't, for some reason, accept that maybe that is who they are. 
maybe the way they're treating you is actually who they are. Why do you need to try 10, 15, 20 different times until you're convinced that that is who they are? Why do you think we do that? Is it the hope or the, the dream that we have of what we want from life? And so we put that on the other person? Yeah, I think it's, it's a mix of all of that, plus how you view life and how you view people. If you genuinely believe that people cannot be bad people, you will continue to try to prove that this person is a good person. Mm. And you, so you will give, offer them opportunities and you will keep trying because you're not accepting that they're showing you that even though they might not be a bad person, this is what they're able to give you right now. We build people up in our minds to be a lot bigger than they actually are. And that's a reflection of us, mm -hmm. right? It's a reflection of how we've defined the world around us and how we've defined ourselves. So to be self-aware means that not only do you understand your life history of what brought you to be who you are today, but that you're also aware that the way that you react to your environment right now is not definite truth. <laughs> so, for example, somebody, you know, opened the door and closed it in your face. It could have been an accident. But if you genuinely believe that they did it on purpose because maybe you've experienced that in the past or maybe your self-esteem is really low. You have to stop yourself before you go to that conclusion and say, is that really true though? And how would I know? Can I just say it really hurt my feelings that someone closed the door in my face, you know, without paying attention that I'm, I'm, I'm you know, walking behind them and just leave it at that and not make it mean something about mm -hmm. you? That self-awareness is really important. You have to be aware of your triggers. You have to be aware of the patterns that your triggers lead you to. Okay, Ooh, yeah, so I'm going to give that. you an example. Yeah. So, so many people will be able to relate to this. You're in a relationship with someone or you're dating someone or whatever. You sense they're pulling away. What do you do? Most people will try harder, yes. right? In that moment, what did you feel? That someone's abandoning you. You will do anything to make sure you don't feel the pain of abandonment. Is it really about them walking away or is it about you wanting to believe that you deserve to be held on to? So you will do whatever it takes to make sure that that person comes back. And the harder you try, the faster they're going to run because nobody likes to be you know, held this way. But so when you sense yourself acting from a place of fear, I'm afraid that someone's going to leave. I'm afraid that someone is going to think badly of me, say it's a workplace setting, or they're going to think I'm not equipped enough with, you know, whatever qualifications. So you try harder. When you find yourself, catch yourself acting from a place of fear, then you say, I'm going to go down that, I know myself, I'm going to go down that path of trying harder, betraying myself, abandoning myself to make sure that someone else doesn't abandon me. So the next time I feel that, I'm going to sit with it and I'm going to recognize it and I'm going to choose to not take that path. You have to learn how to break that pattern. Self-awareness is so important. When you continue living your life, Without that awareness piece, it's the same chapter repeating itself. That's your life. You're repeating the same thing over and over and over, and time is going by. Mm -hmm. You're not growing. Your self-worth is not getting any better. Your self-esteem is not getting any better. You're not working on the things you need to work on. You don't know who you are. So once you become aware of yourself, historically and in the moment, you're golden. My God, I love that. I love that. And then also you say self-acceptance. And I literally yes. laughed out loud in the book where you say, but make sure you actually know who you're accepting. Yes. I was like, that's so right. It's so true. <laughs> yep. Talk to me a bit about that. So many people will say, will think accepting yourself means 
I'm able to be whoever I want to be, wherever I, and I don't really care how people, you know, perceive that. Like yesterday, I was at the airport, and the guy sitting next to me was so loud, and I was on the phone, and the airport was really, really busy, so there's not many places you can, you know, go and talk, mm -hmm. and he was really loud, like really loud. Some people think, that's self-acceptance, that you're able to just mm. do whatever you want and you don't care. And so in Welcome Home, I say, I believe that's indifference. That's not self-acceptance. Because if you make self-acceptance about, you know, not caring if the world accepts you, that's different from saying self-acceptance means I accept myself. Mm. Being indifferent to the world around you or not caring whether they accept you or not, that's a byproduct of that. That's not the end goal. If you don't know yourself, you can't accept yourself because you don't know who you're accepting. So how do you know yourself? You ask yourself the questions that you seek the answers to from the outside. Who am I? When was the last time you looked in the mirror and said, Lisa, who are you? God, I don't know if I ever have. Right? <clears throat> it's a difficult question. But if you sit with it for a little bit, who are you? Ask yourself that question. Ask yourself, why do I believe what I believe? Why do I live my life the way that I do? Why am I scared of X, Y, and Z? Why, why am I in university or college for this program? Mm. Just ask yourself these questions. That's how you know yourself. Don't seek the answers from the external world. So many of us, what we do, and I did this for a long time, I did what my parents wanted me to do. I did what culture and religion wanted me to do. I went to university for science, hated it. But I did it because my parents told me that, you know, that's, and, and I'm not talking badly about them. Mm -hmm. I think they thought if she could get a job as a dentist, that would be great for her future. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> did I want that though? I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know who I was. I didn't even, my definition of who I was was labels. I'm a good daughter. I'm a good sister. I'm a good student. I'm a good Muslim. I'm a good woman, I'm a good, just all these labels. But that's not actually me. Those labels were given to me from the external world. I didn't know who I was or who I, or what I wanted in life, what I believed to be the right path for me. I didn't know any of that. And I believe most people don't know that either about themselves. That I had my own poison, that my insecurities were constantly pumping into my veins, that fear was constantly pumping into my veins. And I realized that as long as I was poison, I could only attract poison. And the only way to get poison out is to begin to speak and allow it to come out of you.